For the past seven decades since partition and independence, India and Pakistan have been enemies. It's been a history of bloodshed, four wars, countless raids, bomb attacks, assassinations, and more recently, the looming spectre of nuclear annihilation. As the two countries prepare to celebrate their 70th birthdays, I'll ask two former foreign ministers from India and Pakistan whether their nations can ever be friends. An upfront special. Hina Rabani Kar and Shashi Tharoor, thanks for joining me on this upfront special, marking 70 years since the independence of India and Pakistan. You're both former ministers in your respective countries' foreign ministries, but you're not in government anymore, and I hope that will mean that you can both speak a bit more freely today about this most controversial of issues, how to resolve the conflict between India and Pakistan, your two countries, enemies for so long. Uh, Shashi Tharoor, I want to begin with you. Given everything that's happened since independence in 1947, the war, the attacks, the mistrust, the animosity. Given all that, do you think Pakistan and India can ever be friends? You know, I was asked that question by a Pakistani journalist last week, and I said very simply that Indians and Pakistanis can be friends and are friends, and you can see this in any number of places around the world. But when India and Pakistan are at stake, alas, the issues become very different because... I believe the fundamental problem that prevents meaningful friendship is, and I'm being very blunt here, the nature of the Pakistani state. In India, our state has an army. In Pakistan, the army has a state. And the army's desire to continue to control an extraordinary set of resources and privileges, including the largest proportion of any country's GDP on the planet for military expenditure and military-controlled entities, gives it a vested interest in stirring up trouble. So any time that uh, a Pakistani civilian government makes peaceful noises that India is all too keen to reciprocate, immediately the military will ensure that they send across a bunch of terrorists to blow up Indians and everything goes back to square one. So you sound pessimistic, Shashi. Is it fair to say you're a pessimist, then? As long as the military dominates Pakistan, draws the red lines for the civilians, and interferes in the conduct of relations with India, I am a pessimist. Yes. Okay, Hina or Rabani. A realist. Okay, Re let's let's ask Hina Rabani Kar. Hina Rabani Kar, optimist or pessimist about the future of relations between India and Pakistan, 70 years after independence? You see, if you look at the history of India and Pakistan. And if you look at the basket of problems that we inherited from the British, the capital that I'm at least speaking from right now, uh, we have, as two countries and two people, only added to the basket of problems that we inherited. We did not take out any uh, issues. We only added to it. And one, for instance, Siachin, a major issue, I would argue, India added to the basket. Many others, Pakistan might have added to the basket. And Kashmir remains unresolved. So despite that, why do I say I'm an indefatigable optimist on this? Because there are bigger problems in the world which have been solved through negotiations, through dialogue. And I do want to comment, because you see, it is very interesting, and it is very good, and it is very fine for you as a host that both Mr. Tharoor and I have actually served in these positions. So we can call, uh, you, can, you can talk conjecture and what it seems, and then we can also talk reality. And I would like to talk reality over here. And talking reality, I can sort of tell you that during our tenure, during the tenure of the Pakistan People's Party government, where we normalized the visa, visa regime, uh, improved it substantially, where we normalized trade relations with India after almost like 40 years, we were very keen to actualize the dream of their prime minister, Manmohan Singh, to convert Siachin into a mountain of peace. And guess what we were told back? That their military was not going to budge on it. And they have now understood. So whereas in Pakistan, the military historically had a role, and now the democratic dispensation is eagerly taking its space back, I fear that in India, but the direction is quite the opposite. Okay. Shashi, uh, how much do you think the conflict between your two countries is to do with religious animosity between Hindus and Muslims? Because a lot of people around the world look at India Pakistan and say, it's a war between Hindus and Muslims. What's your response to that view? What do what about all the Muslims on the Indian side in that case? Mm. Uh, you know, we had very recently as many Muslims as in Pakistan. I gather their population has been growing a bit faster than ours. So uh, perhaps they're, they're ahead now. But the fact is that uh, uh, if that were so, India would not be a country 
with the kind of diversity it celebrates. When some Pakistani generals in 1971 foolishly spoke of a jihad against a Hindu unbeliever, they were fighting a country whose army was commanded by a Parsi, whose air force in the northern sector was commanded by a Muslim, whose eastern command that marched into East Pakistan was commanded by a Sikh, and the general who was helicoptered in to negotiate the surrender of the Pakistani forces was Jewish. That's India. It's not a country of one religion or of one kind of people. It's been always a country for everybody. And that's something that I think uh, is worth fighting for. And many of okay. us in India are determined that we shan't lose that. OK, Hina, uh, you were Pakistan's foreign minister from 2011 to 2013. You're currently a member of your country's uh, largest opposition party. But can I just ask you this? Is it all about Kashmir or is there something else, some other major unresolved issue or aspect to this 70-year-old conflict that's preventing the thaw uh, between, in the frosty relations between India and Pakistan, in your view? No, I, I think Kashmir is clearly the elephant in the room. I mean, there's no denying the fact that Kashmir has uh, continued to be the reason why these two countries has always had an adversarial view of each other. And uh, But uh, you, you have seen that in the last few years, actually the last two years, the last few months, whatever has happened in Kashmir is not something of Pakistan's making or doing. And it is the Indian state's, um, you know, lack of... Um, any uh, humanity in dealing with those set of people. So I completely disagree with this pluralism that Mr. Tharoor is talking about, which is, as I said, that pluralism is now nowhere to be seen. And if you look at the treatment of Kashmiris, now can Mr. Tharoor seriously sit here and tell me that him being a Hindu um, and a member of parliament will be pelleted by the Indian army? You see, when a state starts treating a certain set of people differently, and I'm accepting the fact that in Pakistan, we've had extremist uh, mindset. What I'm saying is that we are moving away from it. So I am generally very optimistic about where this country is going, because I think we've seen the worst as far as Pakistan is concerned. And he's absolutely right on some parts of what his argument is. The military has no business ruling the state of Pakistan. And the military in Pakistan was ruling the state of Pakistan for almost half our previous history. But in the last three terms, the third term, or, or the second term ending soon, the democratic dispensation has taken its space back. And as a oh, former foreign minister... You're not minister, seriously you saying the military doesn't India, still we control Kashmir policy, doesn't still control various armed groups who are carrying out violence on both sides am, of the border. Surely you're not saying that. I am saying... I, I, I'm, I'm surely saying that as far as the military's role in the Kashmir policy is concerned, there's certainly stakeholders because it's a conflict. But can the civilian government okay. take the process forward? I, I, frankly speaking, either I judge the civilian government for not taking that forward because we had actually put the India file at a very good place. We had normalized trading relations to quite an extent. Okay. All they had to do was push it forward and not... And not, not come back. Shashi, uh, Hina, Hina referred to the Kashmir issue as the elephant in the room. A lot of people on the Indian side say that Pakistan is obsessed with Kashmir. It's the only issue that matters to them. One could argue the opposite is true for India, that it's refused to acknowledge how serious the issue is, how dire the situation on the ground is, how many human rights abuses have been carried out by Indian security forces on the Indian administered side of Kashmir. Just putting aside the arguments over sovereignty and borders for a moment, do you accept at least that this is an issue in independent of Pakistan. Pakistan may have a role to play in the violence there, and I'm sure you'll say that, but you would admit that India itself has caused a lot of problems for people living on the ground on the Indian administered side of Kashmir. There are certainly a lot of problems. Maybe before I answer your question, yeah. let me briefly respond to something specifically yeah. Ms. Carr said when she said, as a Hindu, would the Indian army pellet me? Um, uh, and, and, you know, frankly, I'm not a, a fan of pellet guns. But it's unfortunate that it was only those who threw stones at the Indian Army who got uh, fired at with pellets in return. So the fact is, if I wasn't throwing stones at an army check post, I don't think they'd have fired on me. Uh, and, and ultimately, uh, the answer to your larger question is not that there aren't problems. I certainly would not deny them. There are a lot of things that I wish, as an Indian Democrat, I could have seen done differently. But there is absolutely no doubt that those problems only exist because of the violence fomented, encouraged, financed, and equipped from the Pakistani side of the line of control. There is absolutely no doubt that if it weren't for the militants being sent across, uh, who, for example, targeted uh, assassinations of Kashmiri pundits were conducted, and 150,000 of them were driven into exile 
from the only home their families have known for millennia. Uh, we've, seen, we've seen an awful lot of nastiness, uh, to which, unfortunately, the Indian Army has, had, has felt obliged to respond with comparable use of force. Let's ask Hina Romanikar to respond. The violence on the Indian side of Kashmir, at least, is all to do with Pakistani sponsorship and financing, says Shashi Taro. No, again, you see, that's the problem, because no matter what level you have a discussion between an Indian and a Pakistani, they can be ex-foreign ministers, and they can be, you know, relatively, um, I mean, him, a historian and a writer, etc., so far exceeds my level of academic excellence. But it will always degenerate into you did this and we did that, right? Uh, I, I, I could pass on some uh, interesting accounts and good books which were written by Indian, Hindu, Indian, Indians, um, uh, which give a a case-by-case -case account of how the Indian government went wrong, which precedes any violence that even started in Kashmir. So and the current, uh, current violence has nothing to do with Pakistan. And I think on that, there's broad agreement everywhere, even within Indian quarters. We seem to have lost more lives. We have uh, people, we have uh, currently in Pakistani custody, a person called Mr. Yadav, who's who is, by his own acknowledgement, a raw agent instigating violence in Balochistan against Pakistan. So whose country is pluralism and lack of activity within each other's borders are we talking about? Now, we've done this to each other long enough, right? And we have, so we can win arguments and we can win debates and we can even perhaps win wars. But, but Hina, other, Hina right? let me put this but to you before I go back to Shashi. Surely you're not saying that the Pakistani government and military hasn't armed, financed, sponsored some of the most violent groups that the world has seen in recent decades. Most of the international community agree it has. Plenty of Pakistani academics, journalists and politicians agree it has. The US government thinks it has. So, you know, will you, will you say that today? You know what? Pakistan's policy in Kashmir has been a mistake. You yourself admit well, a lot of well, Pakistanis have died I've, as a result of support for sure. those groups. Absolutely. And let me, let me tell you very clearly, I, I think it, it, it has to do with the U.S. policy, it has to do with the European policy, it has to do with the U.K. policy of trying to get rid of the, uh, of the Russians from, from Afghanistan, which polluted Pakistani soil with these mujahideens, which then sort of became something else and became Frankenstein, which the Pakistani state itself could not handle, and the Pakistani state then tried to control them in various ways. I'm not talking about the past here. I'm talking about the present and the future. And I know, as somebody who's worked in the Pakistani state, that the Pakistani state is using its full potential to try and rid the territory of Pakistan from these enemies of the state, so to speak. And I also know that we truly believe, and in this I would include the establishment um, I think with quite a lot of confidence, that instigating violence against another country may, be, may have been considered to be wise policy in the past during the reign of generals um, uh, and military people, but not now. Okay. I can tell you this change has occurred in Pakistan. This change will, however, manifest itself a bit later. Just sticking with Kashmir, Shashi Toro, um, more than, let me just read to you what Amnesty International said in its 2017 country report in India. Uh, uh, more than 80 people, mostly protesters, were killed in clashes, hundreds blinded by security forces' use of pellet firing shotguns. Security forces used arbitrary or excessive force against demonstrators. The state government imposed a curfew for over two months. Newspapers were shut down for three days. Hundreds of people, including children, were put in administrative detention. Pakistan didn't make India do any of that, did it? No, I'm afraid that these are the kinds of things precisely where many of us pass company with our government uh, in its judgment as to what exactly is necessary to do. Uh, the fact is, of course, we are not on the ground. We are not the ones facing the stones and sometimes the bombs of, of, of people uh, who, who we then feel obliged to take action against, which is what's happening with the security forces. You know... Um, uh, it's important that when, 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 when Ms. Carr speaks about some of the uh, setbacks to our recent relationship, I think it's important to understand that every single time the gestures have come from the Indian side. To suggest that, that peace is dawning or that the military is backing off is a bit difficult to sustain when we've actually seen as recently as last year interruptions by the military or sponsored by the military whenever the civilian sides appear to be talking or understanding each other. This is the frustration in India. Many of us feel a lot of sympathy for those Pakistani victims of terrorism, but they're not victims of problems we have created. We haven't sent terrorists to Pakistan to kill Pakistani civilians. These are chickens coming home to roost. 
terrorist groups fomented in Pakistan by the ISI and the Pakistani military for Shashi, own. just on that point, uh, <laughs> Shashi, just on that point, I must yeah, pick you up on that. We have a uh, raw agent sitting in Pakistani prisons right now. Yeah. Uh, are you, well, if he is, yeah. you know, it'd be helpful if you give people access to know who he really is. But Shashi, it's we not just. Absolutely no but Shashi, just on that point, it's, uh, you're, it's, Shashi, just on that point, Chuck Hagel, former U.S. Defense Secretary, said India has over the years financed problems for Pakistan as well in places like Balochistan. Surely you're not disputing the fact that the Indian intelligence, Indian military, isn't involved in Balochistan, in the Pakistani province of Balochistan. I, I, I certainly, I certainly have no evidence of that, but I can only speak from my own knowledge. Perhaps there are. Uh, others doing things. Frankly, many of us in India wish we did mm -hmm. even a fraction of what the Pakistanis accuse us of doing. But it's just from what I've seen of the Indian government, it's not no. the Indian way. Okay, H Hina Rabani, yeah. gestures-wise, uh, Shashi mentioned gestures. Uh, he says all of the gestures have come yeah. from the Indian side. Could you point to a gesture the Pakistanis have made that wasn't, you know, that wasn't responded to by the Indians? Okay, the major gesture that we made, trade. For 40 years, we were not giving India the MFN status and normalizing trade relations. In our government, we actually did it, acknowledge it as a demand from the Indian side. So we have taken a major step on that. And uh, uh, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, again, no friend of mine, visited India uh, on the inauguration of uh, uh, Mr. Modi on his invitation and was treated rather badly, was not even given a chance to have a presser together. So, you know, it's, again, we always look at uh, each other from, uh, from our perspective. I think... Uh, it is really important that we start being um, people of the subcontinent and start looking at this as a picture which is not you versus me, or he did this to us and we did not. I think both of us, let me just allow me to just say this, both of us, both these countries have done a reasonably good job in fomenting uh, crazy behavior or <laughs> bad things into each other's countries. We've done a reasonably good job, I acknowledge it. To, for Mr. Theroux to sit there and blame it all on Pakistan, I think, with ample evidence, and he may not have seen the evidence, I have physically, as, an, as a former foreign minister, seen evidence of India's engagement in Pakistan, obviously not good engagement, through Afghanistan. I have, I have seen physical proofs of that, right? So let's stop denying that we have not been trying to harm each other. Let's accept the fact that we've been trying to harm each other to, our, to each other's detriment. Okay, well, let me, let me ask Shashi Taro this. Is there any future for solving, forget the India-Pakistan conflict, just a specific situation in Kashmir, which is a terrible situation, when India, Pakistan, and the people in Kashmir all seem to be on different pages? India says the status quo, you know, Pakistan says we want a referendum, which India won't allow. The Kashmiris say, we'd, you know, some polls suggest Kashmiris don't want to be part of either country. So what hope is there for resolving the situation on the ground there? Well, at the moment, clearly, things are not in a very good place. But I think if the violence can stop and people on every side can just put away the weapons, then only can you talk meaningfully of a long-term peaceful solution that respects the rights of all stakeholders. I'm very, very interested in seeing peaceful relations on the subcontinent. I have deplored the fact that we are the least integrated sub-region in any mm. region in the world in terms of our trade relationships, our human connectivity, uh, it's absurd that India and Pakistan, uh, after millennia of having been together, now have barely two and a half billion dollars in trade between each other. There's so much we can do. Yet, sadly, Pakistan played a largely obstructive role in South Asia. Do you believe, Shashi, that Sarkin, economics, the trade investment, is a way to build the bridge that hasn't been built over 70 years? Is that, is that enough? Look, I am known in, in the Indian political context as an advocate of better people-to-people -people relations, closer relationships across trade, sport, culture, business, and so on with Pakistan. The problem is people like me will never get our way as long as the people making the decisions feel that this is being proposed at a time when Pakistan has malign intentions in sending militant and terrorist groups across the border to do us harm. Shashi, isn't the problem that you said a moment ago we need to stop the violence on all sides? Wouldn't it be more credible if you argued against Indian excess violence and Kina argued against Pakistani military and ISI excess violence? Wouldn't that give you more credibility if you were both arguing on your own sides against the violence on your own sides? No, but I, if the violence, unfortunately, is provoked by terrorism, I have to stand behind my security forces. I can't... Even when they're raping, even when they're raping killed, women? Like even that. when they're sexually assaulting women? No, Countless we, studies show that that's what's we going on. We don't... No, no, no. I think whatever accusations have been made have been investigated. There have been some court-martials. But in a number of cases, 
what has been blamed on uh, quote-unquote Indian security forces in the larger sense involved actually Kashmiri policemen. And they have... So Human Sandy, Rights Watch and Amnesty and all of those groups are making it up? But, no, no, I'm not saying that. We're talking about incidents that have happened at various bad places of the conflict. All I'm saying is we are committed to human rights in India, and I genuinely believe that there will be Indian voices raised in favor of human rights. While I agree with you that violations have occurred and may well continue to occur as long as violence persists and the army is on a sort of hair-trigger edge and the security forces are on a hair-trigger edge, and that's not just the army, it's also the, uh, the armed police, the Central Reserve Police and the local Kashmiri police, all of whom have been implicated in these incidents. OK. And, and Hina, wouldn't it give you more credibility and Pakistani politicians more credibility in the eyes of the Indians if you were all to come out and say, you know what, our policy in Kashmir of supporting these groups has been an absolute disaster. It hasn't helped people on the ground, on either side of the line of control, and it's given us a reputation as a terrorist sponsoring state. Mehdi, I'm, I'm very glad that you brought this point because this is my this this is the theme of the of what I'm about to, of what I've been trying to say that in Pakistan that has already happened. What you're saying is if you're saying that will give me more credibility, well that that is something I've already said. That's the stated policy. That's the functional policy. That is something which has already been talked about behind closed doors and uh, deciphered upon. And the current policy does not reflect the poor previous policies of the dictators. And if India continues on the trajectory that it is in, on today with the human rights abuses of no proportion, of unlimited proportion in Kashmir and just a general, you know, Muslim uh, killing of Muslims on eating meat type of episodes which have been occurring over there, then well, tomorrow, okay. you know, two years from today or three years from today, Mr. Tharoor may have much less to say and so I have me, much more to we're say. Running out of so time. I'm looking at the trajectories of the two countries going okay, different so ways. we are running out of time. Let me put that point to Shashi Tharoor. A lot of Pakistanis look at what's happening in India today under Prime Minister Modi, a Prime Minister you, you, you oppose, is not in your party, but the, you know, the beef lynchings, the attacks on Christian minorities, and they say this is precisely what partition had to happen. This is why we needed a separate state. Now, on the contrary, many Indian liberals say that the only reason forces like this have been able to rise in India is because of partition and the way Pakistan has behaved. That is that is justified, as it oh, were, their conduct. No, I, I, I want to say, as an opposition member of parliament, as an opposition member of parliament, obviously I've spoken up against the very things you're mentioning. Uh, we have raised our voices and continue to do so against the absurd behaviour of these gaurak shaks who have uh, who have uh, participated in atrocities against Muslims and Dalits. Uh, we have spoken up very strongly in favour of the pluralistic India that I believe is still the majority in India, the, the way in which Indians live and have always lived. Yes, we are a status quo is power. We have no particular desire to see any particular change in the subcontinent anymore. We are devoted to the well-being, prosperity, growth and security of our own people. Uh, Shashi, one, one last question to you before we finish. On that note, uh, if Mahatma Gandhi, if Jawaharlal Nehru, the first prime minister of India, if they were around today to look at the current Indian political scene, the, the, the communal violence, uh, the intolerance, the question marks over their secular legacy, what do you think they'd make of the current Indian political scene? I think they'd feel exactly the way that Jinnah would feel if he were alive in Pakistan today. I think there are things that they would be dismayed by. And I think it's important that we understand that we have this extraordinary legacy of these great liberal-minded, uh, pluralist and secular-minded people uh, whom we are heir to and we must fight to preserve the India that Mahatma Gandhi and Nehru fought to free. Well, you stole my last question to Hina Rabani Kar. Hina, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, founder of Pakistan, secular Democrat. If he were alive today, what would he make of Pakistan? A lot of people say, yours is a country on the verge of becoming a failed yes. state. What would he make of Pakistan today? Mm -hmm. I can say, yes, Muhammad Ali Jinnah would not be happy with the state of affairs in Pakistan right now. But hopefully, uh, I'm continuing to say that in Pakistan, I think we've seen the worst and move, moving. We have made some positive, positive steps and we're moving forward. And I'm amazed through the length of this interview that a person of the acumen of Mr. Tharoor would find that beef lynching, human rights abuses, pellet guns, uh, rape by Indian military of Kashmiri women, etc., is all because of Pakistan. So if there were no Pakistan, India would be a very happy place, almost like the Swiss, you know, Swiss Alps or Swiss, Switzerland living happily ever after. 
And it seems like everything wrong within the Indian state and the Indian people has been triggered by Pakistan. Then Pakistan must be a very important and a very, very powerful country, and far more powerful than the Pakistan that I know. So it's really amazing how we tend to sort of, you know, uh, distance ourselves from the problems which are self-created and throw it on to the other, just across the border. Convenient. We'll have to leave it there. Thank you both for joining me on this Upfront special. That's our show. Upfront will be back in September.